Hello, hello, this is Allie Decker, and you're listening to the Long Game Podcast. Today, I'm chatting with a longtime Twitter friend of mine, Juliana Casale, or according to Twitter, at Attack of the Text. Expanding from an English degree and an unpaid gig as a beer journalist, Juliana's passion for writing led to a 10-plus year career at small and mid-sized B2B SaaS startups. Her first love is content marketing, and her Swiss army knife of skills include CRO, email sequences, social media, community, partnerships, virtual events, and video production. Yes, she has done it all. Today, she works at Wave, an all-in-one money management platform for small businesses. As the content strategist, she owns all the words on the Wave website, email, video, and written resources. In this episode, Juliana and I explore all the things you can do with a love of words and what it was like for her to transition from practitioner to overseeing the big picture. Without further ado, here's Juliana. Thank you for joining me today, Juliana. I'm excited to jump into some questions. Um, about your content marketing career and your journey and all that stuff. So I typically like to open with the same question for everyone because the answers are always so different. Um, Mm -hmm. It's really not that crazy of a question, but what does your journey into content marketing look like? Oh, man. Um, So I am sort of an old school English major, liberal arts type. Um, (laughs) I loved studying books and doing a lot of essays in college and you know, I was just a word geek. I was one of those kids who went to the library and took out the max amount of books and read under the cover. So um, I accidentally stumbled into content marketing because I was super into the written word, um, mm-hmm. but I didn't study it. It wasn't around when I was trying to figure out what my career was as a 20 something. Um, but it fortunately for me became a career path uh, that opened up. And so because I had already invested in being a really great editor and a proofreader. And I really loved, you know, writing casually. Um, it just became an opening that I could pursue. And so I stumbled my way across it. And then as soon as I realized I could continue my career specializing in that, I, you know, I took it. (laughs) So what was your first gig as like a writer or a content marketer? Um, so I had an unpaid gig as a beer journalist, (laughs) Amazing. Which was really awesome. Um, I was in a position where I wasn't really writing for work, but I wanted to do that for fun. And mm-hmm. so this was a the website was called AmericanCraftBeer.com, and they were trying to build up their local presence in major cities. And they happened to need a Boston correspondent uh, when I was living there, and so I volunteered uh, for the gig and. While it wasn't paid in money, it was paid in passes. So like media passes to beer festivals. I got to fly to Denver to go to the Great American Beer Festival there. I got to cover Bonnaroo as the beer correspondent. <laughs> so three years running. So oh that gosh. was well worth it. Yeah, that was really awesome. And so I got to interview really amazing brewers and you know talk about different trends in the industry. I didn't really know very much about beer. So I got to ask the stupid questions and you mm-hmm. know get the answers that most people would want. So I think coming at it from a novice perspective was really helpful to our readers. Um, and, you know, I just had the enthusiasm of, again, a 20 something. So I could right. stay out late at industry <laughs> events. I didn't have to report to anyone. I didn't have kids at the time. So, you know, it was really fun that point in my awesome. life. Yeah. And then I did have a, another paid side gig where um, there's this app called Scout Mob and it was trying to be a Groupon Um And so basically they would send me to restaurants and I'd get to take photographs of the food, interview the business owner, and then uh, do a little pithy write-up about why Mm -hmm. you should go um, check it out and use the deal on the Scout Mob app. So that was really also very fun. (laughs) So it sounds like you went English journalism a bit and then into content marketing. Would you say yeah, that's correct? Yeah, I mean, I wasn't a journalism major, which is interesting, right. but I became a beer journalist because it was writing, you know? Yeah, it's, it was it's, words. Yeah, and I think if you love words, you can do a lot of different types of writing. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that was, I feel like now in my career, I've been very in the B2B SaaS pigeonhole, but mm-hmm. I do have the capability of doing different styles of writing. So I think that just showed my range and made it 
um, easier for me to be hired for different things. Cause I could say, Oh, you need a sample of this, like check it out. This is short copy or this is a long essay, or this is, you know, an article. That's awesome. Yeah. So after scout mob, where did you go? Um, well, so scout mob was a side gig. So these were just, um, so I started out my path really boring. It was like these entry-level positions where I was an editor slash proofreader at a pharmaceutical Mm -hmm. journal of all things, like a print publication. Um, And then um, I was working at this kind of big corporation in tech called Tech Target, and they did a lot of virtual events. And um, so I was kind of doing grunt work on email copy there. So I started doing a little bit, I guess it could be considered content marketing, but it really wasn't. It was like a very laser focused, very repetitive manual kind of thing. It wasn't like we were doing audience research or, you know, there wasn't very much to it. Um, I'd say my big break in content was I started a position at Skyward, which is a content marketing platform. And even though my job wasn't really content marketing, I learned the ropes of how to be a content marketer through learning what the platform did and and why it existed and what the strategy was that we were recommending that brands use. And so I sort of absorbed that. And then from then on, all my positions were related to content marketing, but I sort of got in sideways. (laughs) I feel like there's no straight way. I started my in freelance writing because I liked writing. Yeah. I didn't even care what I wrote about. I obviously have niche things now, but yeah. mine was the same motivator. I just wanted to write. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm still happy today as long as I'm working with words. So I kind of envy the English major. I wish I had done that. <laughs> what <laughs> At was the your time, background? I so I did, I actually was an econ major for most of my college wow. career. And then I switched to marketing at the end because I realized like I love economics, don't want to be an analyst for the rest of my life. Like I didn't yeah. like it that much. <laughs> and on the side, I had been writing like short stories and I wrote for our like college paper. And it, it just never seemed to connect with like I have very pragmatic parents. So they were like, <laughs> ah, English, like as long as you want to go into education, that'd be good. But as a marketing major, I didn't get to do as much writing. And I wish I had, you know, the excuse to write as much in college. Like, I feel like the English majors, y'all have a lot of written projects. And that sounded really fun to me. Um, Well, what happened happened for a reason. But I understand (laughs) what you mean about just loving words. Yeah, that's a lot of people's motivation. Um, So you went from a practitioner, you know, like individual contributor. And now are you more in a people management space at wave or are you still like boots on the ground writer or kind of a combination? It's been a bit of a combination. We are um, about to onboard a direct report for me. Um, so cool. I've been at wave for six months and so far I've been very focused on our website content just because mm. the website before I joined hadn't been touched in at least a couple of years, which is a little terrifying when you think about yeah. you know, how you change your branding over time, or you have new products or features you want to talk about. Like there's a lot that's evolved and the website hasn't caught up to that. And so, Mm -hmm. um, I think everyone's been very aware that every day that passes that we don't update the website, um, you know, is a missed opportunity. And so I've been really focused on conversion rate optimization projects where I'm maybe testing different headlines and, you know, swapping in different types of content. Yeah. So we're about to actually test an explainer video, which I'm really excited about because it hasn't been done as far as I'm aware. Um, Yeah. So I will have a content specialist under me who will be doing most of the copywriting lift Um, in lieu of having that person right now. I've been doing a lot of the email sequence Mm -hmm. projects that have landed in my lap, which is honestly very enjoyable. I find it relaxing. I told my boss that and she's like, bless you. (laughs) (laughs) So your Um, domain is like anything written then? Yes. Um, So website, email, um, like helping with assessing, you know, it does this help center article make sense. Um, I'm working on a chatbot script. <laughs> oh my gosh. That um, sounds so fun. Yeah. Explainer video storyboards, just, yeah. Anything to do with, with content. We actually have this, um, it's like a pillar page called the freelance hub and we mm-hmm. rolled it out in April and just figuring out, you know, does this need to be optimized? If it's popular, is it converting in terms of email signups or, you know, product signups, things mm-hmm. like that. I'm also mindful of like, how do we make this the best hub of information possible for f- freelancers that need to know more about how to run their business? Um, mm-hmm. So that's also my realm. Um, we do have a YouTube channel that also hasn't seen very much love uh, before I joined. And so I think that'll probably be a next year project. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it, everything's fair game, essentially. <laughs> 
So how do you prioritize all of that stuff? Yeah, um, I think uh, the framework of is it on fire is a good one. So yeah, <laughs> like if the website has not been updated in two years, that obviously demands more yeah. time and attention just because that's our business card online. And you know that's the way people understand what we do and who we're for and what the values are that we provide. And so um, that's a pretty obvious one. Um, mm-hmm. I'd say... I say YouTube next year because it is a search, like it's a search engine. Also, mm-hmm. you know, if we're investing in SEO, that should be a realm that we look into. I know a lot of people try to find information on how to accomplish a task by looking at tutorials. And so yep. there's a big opportunity there. And, you know, just from looking at competitors in the space, um, there's a lot of video um, education that you can find on topics like accounting or bookkeeping or, you know, these things that are small business owners come in and they, have never done this before and they want to just do the work, but they also are forced to do these, you know, administrative tasks in the back. Right. Yeah. Which I'm sure you're familiar with if you've been freelance writing. (laughs) Yeah. No, I know the, the balance of working on your business and then working in your business. Exactly. I faced that really early on. I was actually a wave customer for a while when I was full-time freelance, but that was like five, four or five years ago. A lifetime ago. Um, Yeah. (laughs) Um, So I'm going to rewind a little bit and I was doing some research on you and I know you were at crazy egg before, Mm -hmm. before wave. Correct. And I was reading that you actually pitched your job at crazy egg, right? Yes. How did you do that? Like, how did you know that's where you wanted to work? Where did you see like the gap that you could fill? What was that process like? Yeah, that was a really interesting situation. So uh, I had a friend, Devin Bramhall, who had worked Mm -hmm. with uh, the general manager at Crazy Egg who was hiring. And she tagged me on a LinkedIn post that he had written where he said, I have a job opening. I'm not going to give the job description. I'm instead going to ask people what their dream job is. And if I can make it happen with this role, we'll work together to decide what the job description is. And so um, (laughs) I ended up pitching him, but I didn't pitch him on what I wanted. I pitched him on what I didn't want. So (laughs) I just said, here's all my baggage from other marketing positions where, you know, I know I don't want this, 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 and this. And he said, okay, let's chat further. And then we developed what I actually wanted to do. And then we turned it into a job. So that was really cool. (laughs) Well, I I feel like that's interesting that you led with what not, what, I mean, sorry, what you didn't want. Um, cause he, I'm sure right out the gate, he was able to know like, all right, I'm not going to give this to her or this right. is not how we're going to build and structure the role. So exactly. how did you lead with like, I love words or what was that like? Uh, I don't like once you determined that I think, you know, I was like, I feel like a lot of marketing gets, you get in this rabbit hole of like, or you're pigeonholed into this one glimpse of the customer where you're trying to attract them, but you don't see the full journey. And so mm-hmm. what if, what one thing I really wanted to look at was the entire process from how you hear about the product to what you see on the website, to what the next touch point is, to now you're signed up, what happens, like the entire map I wanted to be part of. And so mm-hmm. that was the crux of the position was like, can we look at this whole life cycle and figure out like, not just how do we get people to take the action and sign up, but how do we retain them, get them really comfortable with what we, what we can offer and even like level them up as a Mm -hmm. professional. And that's what I really wanted to be able to do. And through words, I was able to do that, but that was really the, the thing that would compel me to take that position. Yeah. So how did you end up living in content? Obviously you do more than content, even in your role at wave, but it seems like most people's like behind the scenes job description of their content role is mostly like SEO or writing. And it seems like you get to play in a lot of different spaces. Mm -hmm. How did you make sure that that would happen or communicate that? Yeah. So it's really, uh, it's been an interesting path where as I've gone from job to job, you know, it's first you're the individual contributor, then you're the manager, then you're director. And I found myself being pushed that way. And I didn't, really want to do that at the end of the day. It's a right. lot, it's a different skill set, honestly. It's completely different being, you know, the person just doing the stuff to then guiding other people to do the stuff. And mm-hmm. you know, there were some days where I was just like, you know, I just want to do the work again. Right. Um, and so when I got to Wave and we were discussing what I wanted out of the role, one thing was like I can direct people and it's probably good to have one person where we're partnered very closely on what should be done versus, you know, what's 
being written. Um, and so I decided, why don't we do the content strategist role? So I have, you know, the overview of everything that's going on in the company and what needs to be done and what the priorities are. But I can also give very tactical feedback on the content that's being produced and I can do more of the art direction. Um, and so I'm still very involved. And, you know, if I'm needed for coffee, yeah. I can still swap in the way I've been doing for the past month or so. Um, but it's a nice balance of being more high level, being like the director, but also, you know, it's a small enough squad of two people that I'll be, you know, boots right. on the ground still, which is nice. Yeah. I've, you know, same with the very first question I opened with, which everyone has different answers. I always like to ask folks too. I think that having a career in content, mostly when you start as a writer, whether you're a journalist or a copywriter, or, you know, like us just liking words, there's a, there's a point in your career where you go from pen to paper and then you switch to mostly people strategy, yeah. big picture stuff, lots of P words, apparently. <laughs> um, and I'm, you know, I know you're just bringing on one person, um, but that switch for you, it sounds like you didn't want it to be all on one side or the other. Like you really wanted to maintain that middle ground um, outside of like communicating that to your superiors and your hiring managers. Like what else have you done to like, make sure that it stays that way? Um, I will say that. So before wave, I was actually freelance writing, um, okay. doing content marketing. Um, so that was also wave declaring, like I'm yeah. only going to do the work that I want to do. Um, mm. which was, I had never done it before. I'd never had to find my own work or define what I was offering or yeah, again, manage a business. So I think having come from that background of I'm picking and choosing what projects I want to do and it's all things that I'm doing myself and executing from start to finish that kind of showed wave that that's right. that was my focus so I think mm -hmm. kind of leading by example has been helpful um and yeah just having the range of projects that I can show you know that I can do more than just strategy or just writing like I am right the multifaceted marketer. So marketer. I think when you show people all the possibilities, they're more excited for you to stretch um, the boundaries and either do more of what you can show you've done before or try new things because yeah. you know, I've definitely taken on stuff I've never done before and had to figure it out along the way. <laughs> so fun. Yeah. So would you say like, it's easier to keep that balance at a smaller company? A uh, smaller company, you're definitely doing more than one type of marketing. Right. Um, what excited me about this role is that there's enough specialization that I feel like I'm not having to do too many things outside what I want to focus on. So for example, we have an SEO specialist, so I don't have to do the keyword research. Like we're going to partner on that with um, whatever strategy we come up with for the next quarter. So, mm -hmm. you know, she'll be running like the content audit or competitor analysis or things like that and kind of feeding right. that insight to me, which is great. And then I can kind of take that and synthesize it into, okay, how do we actually produce articles or mm -hmm. videos or things like that? Um, we have a data analyst, so I don't have to really worry about setting things <laughs> up on the back end or, you know, like we have an email specialist. I don't have to worry about HubSpot, yeah. you know, there's a lot of stuff where I'm freed to really hone in on what my role is supposed to be instead of, you know, all these other outside tasks that could creep up and, and take a lot of my attention away. Um, and like I said, with stuff on fire, you <laughs> want to be able to focus on those things and get them down to smoldering as soon as possible. Yeah. It's like yeah. finding the balance where you can stay in your like lane or like set of lanes, but yeah it's not so focused that you can't play an email or a chat exactly. box scripts. Like it, that's, that sounds like a really fun thing. So you're not only doing like one specific task, but you still don't have to be like a catch all as like a marketer. Yeah. Um, Cause I mean, you know, you see these job descriptions out there where it's like you're five people right. doing, you know, and it's just so much to try to get good at any one thing when that's your day to day. I yeah. can imagine that'd be frustrating if you did it for too long. So, yeah. And I know that's there's awesome. a lot of burnout in marketing because, you know, that's the, that's the state of it. But um, I think having been at, you know, smaller startups and then mid-sized startups, and this yeah. is a 300 person company, I do wow. have the luxury now of having a marketing department where we're still pretty lean, but we do right. have dedicated resources that, you know, gets, you know, they all help build this, engine and you know not any one person is taking on <laughs> things way outside the realm that sounds like the dream yeah um, 
<laughs> so what's one job experience, and this could be a project, a role, anything that you never hope to repeat? Oh boy. <laughs> never hope to repeat. Or hope never to repeat. I guess you could say either way. Um, I feel like everything that's been super stressful has in the end done well. So yeah. I don't, it's like things where I've had just anxiety or, you know, sleepless nights over, you know, it ultimately worked out where I was really proud of the results. So I don't, I wouldn't wish that I hadn't done it because it's, I, it's really for a reason. good. Yeah. It's really good experience. And I, I know better next time. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, yeah, I don't know. I don't think anything was a nightmare. I will say migrating from one software platform to another is something no one really (laughs) enjoys that I wouldn't want to do again. I think I've been there um, too. Yeah. It's like when you go from one CMS to another, or, you know, we might be actually doing that soon or yeah, like email providers, things like that, that is no fun. And you don't really see the results in any tangible way. It's just things are easier to do down the line. So yeah, um, I wouldn't repeat that again eagerly. (laughs) Right. Or like the person who comes in next will reap the benefit, but like you have to do. Yeah. It's like when you date someone who's really terrible and then they get married and seem really happy and you're like, I did that. You're welcome. (laughs) You should send me a present. I coached you. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Yep. I've 100% been there. Yeah. So I know how that is as a girl. Um, yep. So I'll flip that on the, on the head and say like, what are your top two favorite projects in your career? So you can be like publication, even like a specific article or a whole job that like, however you want to define that. Interesting. Um, yeah, I will say, so my last role before I started freelancing was I worked at a FinTech company and they needed videos produced and I had never done any video outside of those animated explainers where it's, you know, drag and drop, basically you just give someone a script and it turns into a cartoon and they already have Mm -hmm. the cartoons done and it's sort of, you know, plug and play. Um, But this was real people (laughs) in in like a setting, like several settings, locations. So it was start to finish, like, okay, I come up with a script and a storyboard and we have to figure out where to shoot this. And we've got to get someone who knows how to work the camera and we've got to um, get actors. I mean, it was, Mm -hmm. it ended up being just the staff at the company, but they had to come in on a Saturday. It was the day after our holiday party. So that was really rough. Um, and then it's, yeah. And then it's cutting down like two or three hours of footage to 30 seconds, like the whole thing. Um, and I was just really stressed about it because I agreed to do it. I always say yes. And then I figure it out along the way, (laughs) but this one was, I almost, regretted doing that. You know, yeah. usually I, I just, I'm like, Oh yeah, I'll figure this out. But this was tough. This is really tough. Video is a whole different yeah, thing. It is a beast. And I didn't have a video Oof. background at all. Yeah. So, um, I mean, the art direction part was really fun. Uh, coming up with the storyboard storyboards was really cool. And then making sense of all the footage and saying, mm-hmm. we want that. We want that. Mm-hmm. Here's how we build the narrative. That was really neat. Mm-hmm. Um, I think once we shot it, I could relax a lot, but just getting all the details of where people needed to be when, and, oh, that was a mess. Um, but I was really proud of it and I was yeah. in it too. So I'm like, there's uh-huh. one scene where I'm in the line as a customer and, oh and that was gosh. really fun. Um, and I get to show my work. So that's yeah. pretty neat. Um, and as part of that video um, project, we also, I had to fly to New York to do an onsite um, case study. So I got to interview our customer and um, again, like shoot B-roll and figure out what questions to ask them and capture them doing silly things as, you know, little asides. And so that was really neat experience. I'd never flown anywhere for a video or, or anything like that either. So yeah. that was like a, a whirlwind one day and I was exhausted afterwards, but oh um, that was super fun. Um, what else? So we did, um, I was at a, let's see, this is a real estate website provider, um, and email provider. So like agents who need to market their services, Mm -hmm. we provided, you know, the CRM and the, like the, what the front end looked like. And we wanted to test pilot a conference, but we didn't want to do an in-person conference because we weren't sure what the results would be. And that's a huge investment. And, Mm -hmm. you know, they didn't really have the, the staff to make that happen, but what they wanted to test pilot was a virtual conference. So this was about four or five years ago. And, 
yeah, they decided let's just try it. And so we're going to get a bunch of speakers to submit video. Um, Mm -hmm. And the idea was it's going to be different tracks. So it'd be a five day conference and each day would have a specific track on marketing. So like how to get new leads or what to put on your website or how to use content or how to do email drips. And so every day was a roundup of speakers on the different aspects of that topic. And you would sign up for the whole thing, but we'd only unroll one track per day. So mm-hmm. you'd focus on that theme. And so it was, you know, build a landing page where people could register. And then it was build the page where the actual content exists and then build the email drip. So every day a new thing is unlocked. And then, so the whole thing, you know, there were a lot of real estate influencers that we involved as the speakers. So we had yeah. to get them to film their, their segments. And so the whole production, and we had to use an agency for a lot of it. Um, and so there's a lot of, you know, coordination, project management, you know, review of all the assets to make sure everything was together. We had to put yeah. a, a promotional package together so the speakers could share with their audience. Um, and so that we had a target, I think, of 2,000 registrants and we got 5,000, which is wow. thick. So um, <laughs> very happy with that. Um, yeah. So it's just these things where it just seems impossible. It seems so big. And you just take it one bite at a time. And then the end product, you're just really amazed at yourself and and proud of the results. Were you in like a content role when these projects came up? Yes. So for Playster, which was the real estate company, I was the content marketing director. So I had a team of two writers Hmm. and then maybe one other resource. I think we had an email specialist as well. Um, but then we had an agency do a lot of the design work. Um, and then for the video production, I was the head of marketing services and I had a few people under me as well, including someone who had video experience to help me find like someone to shoot it and help with the editing and things like that. So, oh my gosh. um, <laughs> so fun. Yeah. That stuff sounds so fun. There's something to be said about like finding that perfectly sized company where you get to just play all across the marketing org. Um, I envy that. (laughs) That sounds like a blast. So as a content marketer, I mean, I guess you do work like on a bunch of different types of like specializations, like email sounds like you do something like a lot of stuff with copywriting. How do you keep your skills sharp? Like what kind of books and podcasts and newsletters or just courses or anything that you do to kind of keep yourself. Yeah. Um, so I just read a lot. It doesn't have to be about marketing. In fact, I prefer not to read about marketing. Same. Same. Um, so I'm currently reading a bunch of classics. Like I just finished great expectations. I'm in the middle of Jane Eyre. Um, I just, just, I love reading. Yeah. Still an Um, English major. (laughs) Yeah. Still an English major. Um, podcasts, um, there is one podcast called Everyone Hates Marketers that is really informational and hilarious. Um, mm. So I really like listening to that um, occasionally. Like it's not my downtime listen. Again, I like to listen to like Conan O'Brien's podcast if yeah. I want to be entertained while I'm taking a walk or something. Um, but I will say like most of my learning comes from networking with other marketers. So mm. there's definitely a ton of Facebook groups, Twitter groups, Slack groups, um, part of a Slack community called Content Marketing Leaders that's Mm -hmm. mostly Canada-based, but there are U.S. people in there too. Um, And it's just amazing for resource sharing, asking questions, um, you know, sharing wins, things you're proud of, um, job opportunities. Like it's just so active and engaged and friendly Mm -hmm. and there's no stupid question. And odds are that people have asked the same thing you're asking. And so you can always search it for for yeah. you know, answers to things, which is really nice. Um, I find marketing Twitter is super friendly too. If you ever have anything you need, you know, you just put the APB out there and people will respond or yeah. share it. Um, and then I know there's like Twitter chats too, that you can be part of. Um, I'm subscribed to a fair amount of emails. Sometimes mm-hmm. I read them, sometimes I don't, but, um, you know, there's always people that are sharing their expertise there. Um, and then let's see classes. So I'd actually enrolled in a CXL class. It's like a conversion marketing thing. I haven't had a chance to start it, honestly, but it's on my to-do list. Um, I think it's one of those things like they give you all the curriculum and you can kind of chip away at it over time. And I've been meaning to put some time on my calendar for Fridays to give it 
attention. I haven't yet, but yeah, I know how that goes. (laughs) It's kind of refreshing that you don't listen to a lot of those podcasts because I don't either. I mean, ironically, we're on one now. Yeah. (laughs) I like listening to our own podcast. Everyone knows those are garbage. No, (laughs) no. I mean, selfishly too. I love these because I get to chat with people and like really meet people, I guess as much in person as we can these days. But, um, I just don't connect with like the long form generic, like interview ones. That's why we try to take these on as like coffee chats or those post-conference, let's get a drink and just shit all over marketing Twitter chats. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, those contrary and opinion conversations, but I actually prefer like reading fiction and just other types of, I feel like any kind of reading makes you a better writer. Um, yes. But I always like to ask that question because sometimes people will like have really unique things that they do. Um, I've heard good things about the CXL courses too. One of my business partners for Omniscient used to be at CXL and he's a big fan of their courses. Nice. Um, are you taking that one right now because of the explainer video testing and all that stuff you're working on? Um, it was more like I haven't invested in a class or a certification in a while and I felt like I should level up. Um, mm-hmm. You know, whenever I get a new role, I, I want to make sure I'm up to date and I'm offering as much value as possible. And what's really nice about Wave is they give you a stipend for learning. Oh, nice. So, hey, it's free. I'm going to take the opportunity right. to, yeah, to learn. So that's awesome. Um, yeah. What's cool too is they also offer management training, which mm-hmm. I, one of the reasons I didn't really like being a manager is I never got trained on how to be a good one. And Mm -hmm. so it was all sort of on the job, trying to be the best I could be, but not having any real structure or guidance on it. And so I love that aspect as well, because when you're in charge of marketing and you have people under you, you want to make sure you're, you know, helping them level up in their careers Mm -hmm. and doing the best job they can. And so that's also really a nice benefit. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, I just have one more question. Um, I like to finish with this and if there's more than one piece of this, you can share that, but what's the most important piece of advice you've ever been given? Oh goodness. (laughs) In marketing or in general? In general or one of each or whatever comes to mind. Sometimes it can overlap. Um, I'll say it and then I'll say it's really hard to follow, (laughs) which is... (laughs) Don't tie your worth to your work, uh-huh. which I, I've struggled that it, it's absolutely excellent advice. Like your job and what you do for money isn't who you are as a person, but you know, it's the majority of the time you spend on this planet. So it's really hard to disconnect yeah. those two things, but I've been through three layoffs and it's a hard lesson to learn that you are, you know, if you have, if you have a company that you report to you at the end of the day, they're going to do what's in their best interest and you have to do what's in your own best interest. And, you know, being your own boss is a whole other um, challenge, but Mm -hmm. like you own your worth and you can absolutely forge your own path if you have to. And so Mm -hmm. like having that confidence in yourself and your abilities and just knowing that you're, you're good at what you do and just kind of owning that is, is so important for being confident. And I think it's going to trickle down to things like you know, job negotiation, like when you're trying to figure out what your salary is, even like if you have that confidence in yourself, you know, you're going to advocate for being paid what you're worth. Or if you're doing freelance work, same thing. I think it's really easy to lowball yourself and that's just going to hurt you in the long term. So, yeah, I think just like recognizing like what's the worst case scenario, you know, and then saying, you know, I, you can recover from that and build your own path if you need to. So, right. Um, but it's tough. It's tough. I mean, <laughs> A lot of people are tied to their careers and their professions. And I think honestly, having a baby has helped me realize that I'm more than just, you know, a marketing person. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. That's, I think the biggest downside of doing what you love for work. Yeah. Um, It's kind of a two-sided coin, (laughs) but I also think there's something to be said about being so digital and like always on. Um, like my fiance is a teacher and he loves his job, but he's able to kind of separate it, like leave his work at work or school. Whereas, you know, our jobs are harder to just let go of, um, at home. So that's, such yeah, a I mean, especially if you do network and you are part of these communities that are like always in your phone and, you know, there's no separation between my friends on Twitter and my marketing yep. peeps on Twitter. And so my yep. feed is just a mishmash of 
you know, personal yeah. information or updates, but then it's also, you know, check out this webinar or, you know, right. this is trending. And so, yeah, it's true. It's really hard to, to parse that out mentally. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for joining me today. Um, before we sign off, uh, I'd love to ask if there's any info you'd like to share with people who want to follow up with you or learn more about what you do or what wave does. Yeah. Um, so I'm fairly active on Twitter. Uh, my handle is at attack of the text. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it was hard to come up with a handle when I signed up. So I just sort of started putting random words in there. Um, and then I'm on LinkedIn. Um, I will probably not approve you as a connection if you don't leave a note because people just try to sell me too often. Absolutely. Um, so just drop me a note and say, you heard this podcast and mm-hmm. we can be friends. And then um, wave is waveapps.com. If you want to check out what we do for free, you know, free tools for small business owners. Um, otherwise, yeah, I don't, I don't have anything to sell awesome. you on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I appreciate it. Um, well, thank you for joining me today. Yeah. Yeah.